Mark Davidson had a job few of us would want and even fewer could do. He was a sniper with the New South Wales Police Force. On a chaotic December morning five years ago, Mark was one of the first officers called to a siege in the heart of Sydney. He took up position in a nearby building and for the next 16 hours pointed his weapon at the windows of the Lindt Cafe. But in all that time, there's one thing this professional killer didn't do. He didn't pull the trigger when he had the chance to stop Man Haron Monis, the terrorist holding 18 hostages. Tonight, Mark Davidson tells why he believes he should have. Mark Davidson shoots with pinpoint accuracy. And that means when he pulls the trigger... ..it's deadly. Well, if you're looking at someone front on... You want to go in here. As a sniper for the New South Wales Police, Mark Davidson was trained to kill. And that's what he believes he could have done in December 2014, the day terrorist man Haron Monis walked into Sydney's Lindt Cafe taking 18 hostages. You believe you could have killed him? Yes. For 10 long minutes, Mark had the terrorist in his sights, but didn't take the shot. It meant that hours later, and powerless to act, he could only watch as hostage Tory Johnson was executed. In my opinion, I believe Tory was a preventable death. And I've lived with that for years. Mark's story is one of regret, and heartache and of missed opportunities on a day that he believes should have been so different. Certainly I believe on the day we didn't, as a collective, play how we train. We could have, we could have saved the hostages. We could have saved Tory at least. On Monday, December 15, 2014, Australians experienced terrorism at home like never before. Move! Everyone move! When man Haron Monis, a lone gunman wearing an ISIS headband, walked into the Lindt Cafe in the heart of Sydney, brandishing a rifle and claiming he had a bomb in his backpack. But now hundreds of police officers shutting down the crowded Martin Place. The Police Tactical Operations Unit, including Chief Sniper Mark Davidson and his team, were dispatched almost immediately. On the way, what were you thinking? Like most of the guys on that day, I, I presume there was a good chance we weren't going home. Why did you think that? Well, the reports were in the early stages that he had a bomb or bombs. He claims that he's planted two bombs in the cafe and two others in the city. This was different because it's, it was a terrorist event. No one ha actually had confronted a situation like that in Australia before. No, that's fair to say, I think, yeah. Did that change the dynamic at all, do you think, for you? Not really. Like, most of us just defaulted to my training. I knew exactly what I was preparing myself to do when I got there. Police had trained for a terrorism hostage event, but as the city went into lockdown, for some inexplicable reason, the procedures they would normally follow were ignored. I had it in my mind that I would be performing a coordinating role in the command post. And you did that because that's protocol? Yes. I was most senior in rank on that day and had the most training on that day as well, yeah. You went into the command post? At the start, yes. Why didn't you stay? I was told to leave. And do you know why? No. 
It would be the beginning of a day that left Mark confused about the police plan of attack. Instead, he was sent into the field with his team, taking up positions surrounding the Lint Cafe. One sniper sits opposite the cafe in the Channel 7 building. But the studio's bulletproof glass means the sniper can only take an observational role. Mark and two snipers set up in the Westpac Bank, diagonally opposite the cafe. Two other snipers are located in the reserve bank. What were you seeing? Well, I mean, in the initial stages, it was uh, mostly the hostages um, standing, facing out of the windows. And are you getting a sense of their fear? Because you're presumably getting a closer look than most. You could see that in their face. A lot of them had their eyes closed and were trying to go to a place in their mind that helped them stay calm, I presume. I was always wondering when this shot was going to take place because we're just sitting there waiting and waiting. For the 18 hostages inside, waiting for police to act was all they could think about. Nearly five years on, the horror of that day still feels very real for hostage Paolo Vasallo. So you were waiting for the shot? I, I was, myself, yes. There was countless times where he was walking and he was free on his own at the window and um, they will take the shot or just do something. It's confusing for the public because we see this as a pretty straightforward situation. A terrorist takes people hostage. Why didn't you just turn up and shoot him at the first available opportunity? Just shoot him. Uh, I understand that. But the reality is it's not that simple. If you're going to kill someone, first of all, you need to justify an immediate threat to everyone. And I know some people may say, well, they were held against their will by an armed man. That's the immediate threat satisfied there. But using lethal force also needs to be a last resort. The snipers couldn't take a shot unless they had a clear view of Monus and believed they could take him out. But what weighed heavily on Mark's mind was Monus's claim he had a bomb. The bomb, the notion of a bomb, was a serious impediment, wasn't it? Yes, certainly it was a major factor in everyone's mind. And the detonation of something like that in a, in a space like that is catastrophic. Uh, an Islamic extremist engaged... Well, publicly, we don't know who these people, uh, who the person is. Uh, they haven't apparently identified... By mid-afternoon, those inside were beginning to lose hope that they somebody. would be saved. Nearly six hours into the siege, three hostages made a daring escape. Paolo was one of them. At 3.35, he ran for his life out through a side door. You escaped and you said it was bittersweet at the time. Yes. Do you still feel that way? Yeah, I, I feel I escaped for, for nothing. I thought, if I'm going to leave this place, the last thing I would want to do is be in here for all these hours and go outside and not provide information that will be vital to saving the people that I cared in there. When two more escaped, police now had five hostages providing them much needed information from the inside. But intelligence vital to snipers was potentially missed because they didn't have anyone in the police command post. There was a decision though made not to have a sniper in the police command post. Was that a bad idea? I think a sniper coordinator would have been a great advantage under the circumstances. Chief Constable Simon Chesterman is one of the UK's most senior counter-terrorism experts and independently reviewed the New South Wales police operation during the Lint Cafe siege. I think the sort of intelligence available from escaped hostages is absolutely invaluable. So, you know, the intelligence debrief of a hostage that's just come out of that scenario 
um, is, is extremely fruitful in terms of the tactical options available to you. Well, in terms of Monis and his claim he had a bomb in his yeah. backpack, the sorts of information a sniper might want to know would be what? So anything about the nature of the backpack, whether it did have wires, its weight, how he was handling it, what he said about it, you know, anything at all would have been really valuable to them. Because because sniper is thinking, well, if I take a shot and it and it's able to penetrate the glass and it reaches Monis, what's it going to do to that backpack? And therefore, what's it going to do to the hostages? So all of that really did need urgent attention. No! Hostage Paolo Vasalo always believed any information he had about Monas and the backpack was important. You told three police officers you saw no evidence of any bomb. Yes, I clearly told them that there was no wires on there and they asked me, did I see anything that looked like, may have looked like a wire? And I said, no, there's nothing from him at all. And you were quite detailed in conversation with... Yes, I was, I was. I with told, police officers. I told them that the bag was moving very lightly um, it, it wasn't sagging from the back, and and nothing I nothing attached it was to there. his hand. No, there was nothing. No, no doubt at all. In fact, all the hostages who'd escaped told police they'd not seen wires coming from the gunman's backpack. It meant, quite possibly, there was no bomb at all, and we now know there wasn't. But for Mark Davidson, it was information that could have made the difference between taking and not taking the shot. But it's information he never got. Any information related to that backpack was crucial then? Very important to what we do. Coming up... I can see Monster's head. You could see the shiny sort of bald scalp. A monster in his sights. You had no doubt it was him. I didn't have doubt it was him. Stand by, stand and by. ten Fire minutes mode. to take the shot. And you're weighing up, shooting someone. So what stopped the sniper? Things occurred on that day that I don't understand. That's next on 60 Minutes. It's been nearly five years since the siege and Mark Davidson still finds himself coming here to the Lindt Cafe in Sydney's Martin Place. I can't explain why I come back. It's maybe to pay homage or respects. Inside, he always takes a seat at Table 9, Window 2, where hostage Tory Johnson was executed. I suppose I'm, I'm there as a sign of respect. I like to sit, yeah. Well, it gives me some comfort. Mark was an elite marksman with the New South Wales Police. His sense of calm and stealth made him the perfect sniper. As he lay in wait for his prey, man Haron Monas on the night of the siege. When you were here on the night, you were up here, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And from that point, that's where you you saw Monus. Yeah, or in window four, that's right, yeah. That, that period, and that's, that's window four there? Yep. Yeah, the last one on the right. From his position in the Westpac Bank, Mark had been constantly scoping for Monus. Ten hours into the siege, at 7.38, he saw him. Monus had moved to the... Uh, corner of the cafe. He was terrified of um, silhouetting himself in the window frames. Generally, he moved deep in the cafe, so he was hard to see. So at, at this time, at 7.38, he had taken a seat on the floor where I could see Monas' head, or about two-thirds of his head. You could see the sh um, shiny sort of bald scalp and the Islamic uh, black bandana with white writing across the front that went across his forehead. You had no doubt it was him? I didn't have doubt it was him, but people in the command post had doubt it was him. But you didn't? No, I didn't. But Mark knew that making the wrong decision could cost him dearly. You can take the shot. You don't have to be told when to take the shot. Any police officer is justified in using lethal force in the defence of themselves or someone else, and there's no other way of 
stopping that threat. So it's the same for me. Is it tough as a sniper sitting there looking, knowing this is my man, I could do this? Yeah, it's very tough. But you're there, you know it's him. But you can't pull the trigger. And you're weighing up shooting someone. And if you think you're not justified, then you're facing murder charges yourself. It actually occurs to you that if I get this wrong, I'm up for yeah. murder. For 10 whole minutes, Mark had Monus in his sights. And what did you do in that 10 minutes? I photographed him a number of times. I made a radio call about it and I telephoned uh, um, the command post. I have the tango in white window four. You just see his head. I needed to justify taking a shot. Namely, that he was pointing a shotgun at hostages at that time. And secondly, that he didn't have an initiation device in his hand. Yeah, I didn't want to cause an explosion in that place that killed everyone, if he had that. What was the reply? Uh, that information was not available. And how did that impact your decision making? Well, there was some doubt in, to, in my mind as to whether I was justified in shooting him then. So I didn't. Ten hours in, he hasn't surrendered. He hasn't negotiated. He's doing nothing to help resolve the situation. And you have an opportunity to shoot him. Still no justification? That's just the call I made at the time. And I've got to live with it. This is a difficult position for a sniper to be in. He can see Monus, but he can't take the shot because he urgently needs more information. Frustratingly, there was intelligence available. Firstly, that there didn't appear to be wires coming from the terrorist backpack, but there was more. Tory Johnson, the manager of the Lindt Cafe and still a hostage inside, only half an hour earlier had sent a critical text message. What did that text say? Uh, it says Monas was in the corner all by himself. Sitting in the corner by himself. Paolo Vasalo worked at the cafe and was a close friend of Tori. He'd escaped just a few hours before receiving Tori's message. And you had a policeman near you? That's right. And I showed him my phone. He had a look at it. And he said, OK, I'm going to pass that on. Do you believe that this was Tory saying, you can get him now? Yes, that's exactly what it was for. That's what it was sent for. He sent that message so some type of action would take place and nothing took place. How critical would that piece of information be for you? Uh, a text message coming from a hostage inside the premises would have added to confirming his identity if there was any doubt with people that were unsure. That sort of intelligence would be absolutely gold dust. So to, to have a plan in place, to learn that hostages uh, are away from the hostage taker and the hostage taker is on his own in the corner, um, probably would have been a good point that uh, the commanders could have then considered intervention. UK policeman Chief Constable Simon Chesterman is an expert in counter-terrorism. to respond to these incidents and... Having independently reviewed the siege operation, he says officers in the field were always at a disadvantage because of the lack of a clear plan of action. On the day, do you believe decision-making was impacted at all by what appeared to be some confusion? I think these incidents are always going to be confusing, but the thing that the officers must absolutely know on the ground is, is where's the tipping point, at what point are we going to intervene, what exactly are we going to do? Simon Chesterman believes police commanders should have gone on the front foot, do what they trained to do, and authorise a DA, Deliberate Action Plan, which would have meant using all the information available 
and taking Monus by surprise, instead of waiting until the terrorist did something catastrophic. I wouldn't say we were setting the officers up on the ground to fail, but we were making their lives a lot more difficult. For me, the lack of a DA in place on the ground was a pivotal um, issue for them, and I think they suffered as a result of it. So the bottom line is, because this plan to take him by surprise, take him on our terms, because that wasn't approved, it denied those opportunities? Yes, it did. Things occurred on that day that I don't understand to this day. Does that mean you're confused about what was planned and what wasn't? Yes, it does mean that. Certainly, I believe on the day, we, we didn't, as a collective, play how we train. Things were done differently than you were used to? Yes. What we do is, is simple in the terms of you don't have to make things up. You just pretty much run off a checklist. At 2.03 a.m., more than 16 hours into the siege, six more hostages make a dramatic escape. It would be the first time Monus fires his shotgun. You saw that? Well, I heard it. It doesn't get much worse from a hostage point of view. Mm. When you see that, do you know things have changed? Well, I, I mean, I speculated that he was thinking he's really now lost control. Mark and his team were on full alert, scoping for Monus. But the night deteriorates quickly. And within minutes, the gunman forces hostage Tory Johnson to his knees. You saw Tory on his knees. Yeah. Hands behind his head. You reported that? Yes. Well, any, any significant change inside the premises is something that has to be communicated to the command post, yeah. So there was conjecture as to whether that transmission was received in the command post. Mm, but I'm certain I made it. Shockingly, in this horrific moment, perhaps the most critical information of the night never got through to the police commanders. Stand by, stand by, all teams over hostage, put to his knees inside white window. Is it information that you thought might change things? Yes. So if it didn't get there, that's deeply disappointing. Yes, it is very much so. For five long, terrible minutes, all Mark can see is Tory on his knees, but he can't see Monus. Suddenly, Mark hears a second shot. Monus has fired his gun again, but at no one. And you see something happen with Tory. Well, he flinched. I definitely saw Tory flinch and his body was engulfed by an orange flash of light, which I believed was the muzzle flash of the shotgun. Tory comes back up. Yeah, he sits back up, doesn't turn around, doesn't attempt to get eyes on Monus or what he was doing or doesn't attempt to look for an opportunity to charge him or rush him or get the gun. It was... It was quite remarkable. It was like he was resigned to his fate, that he's... that his soul had resigned itself to leaving his body at that time. The third shot rings out. Did you see that? I saw the results of it. And that's when um, Tory died. Yeah. Coming up. I believe Tory was a preventable death. That you knew you could have done it. We could have 
save the hostages. Putting a policeman's plan to the test. Do we need to consider the angle of the glass, given that you're on the first floor? The experiment that shows... Well, that's what we trained for. It wasn't hard, we didn't have to be creative. Three, what should two, have happened. One. That's next on 60 Minutes. Chief Police Sniper Mark Davidson has just witnessed the execution of hostage Tory Johnson. He's powerless to do anything other than radio the police command post. Call teams, white window two, hostage down, hostage down. I repeated it a number of times. Hostage down, hostage down. Because there was a pause in the radio uh, after I said it initially and I was wanting to make sure that I had been heard and that it was clear someone had been killed and uh, they needed to go. The Lint Cafe siege ended when the gunman, Man Haron Monis, was taken down in a hail of police bullets. But two hostages, Tory Johnson and Katrina Dawson, had lost their lives. Australians were shattered and shocked by what they had witnessed. We know full well there's just time. And Mark began to struggle with the outcome. So is it wrong to dance this line? The bottom line is for you that you knew you could have done it. We could have saved the hostages. We could have saved Tori, at least. And that, that's the hard bit. It's hard. In my opinion, I believe Tori was a preventable death. What about, what about Believing he could have saved the lives of hostages has caused Mark enormous grief. But there have been questions of whether it was truly possible, whether the snipers could have ever taken an accurate shot through two panes of glass. Did that concern you? Yes, definitely. You want the projectile to travel some distance to become more stable in flight and uh, contacting something heavy like glass at the muzzle end is a particularly problematic so shooting through the first pane of glass is a concern? Yes. Because you can't guarantee its projection to the second pane of glass? Very unreliable. That means what? You have to break the glass? That means, uh, where possible, we need to get a hole in the glass at the firing end. Mark had a plan. It involved two snipers, one to blast a hole through the bank glass the other to almost simultaneously take the shot at Monas. And it was what we trained for, so it wasn't uh, hard. We didn't have to be creative necessarily. We were just going through what we knew we had to do. And what you believed would work if you had to do it. That's right, yes. But to ensure the target is totally debilitated, the sniper's shot needs to be chillingly exact. You shoot them through the brain stem. They would just drop literally in a heap, which is what we want to achieve if we do take a shot. And that's under the nose? Well, if you're looking at someone front on, it would be under the nose. Yeah, you want it to go in here. It's a fairly precise shot to take, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's what we train for. On a rural property in Victoria, we put Mark's plan to the test. Recreating the challenge Mark and his team faced that night requires meticulous planning. Do we need to consider the angle of the glass, given that you were on the first floor? It's firing slightly down. Ballistics expert Ben Yu prepares the site. There's our target. So how would that have been orientated? So the, the perspective that I had was pretty close to that, coming in this that way. perspective, yeah. yeah. So the brainstem shot would have been sort of back of the ear. The gun power from these safety universal receivers 
is equal to the weapons Mark and his team would have used. I just need to make a clear passage for the projectile to pass through, so yeah, that should do that without any trouble. And the two panes of glass, like that at the Westpac Bank and the Lindt Cafe, are placed the same 59 metres apart. We can actually check our range, so we should be set up exactly on 59 metres. Yeah, it looks really good. Mark even spots the target on the glass, yeah, just, just right as there. was done on the night. Yeah, we're good to go. Excellent, thank you. And it's all to be recorded by a high-speed camera to capture the impact. So it's just chambered both rounds and they're locked in to battery now, which means the ready? bolt's locked. It is a tense moment. Three. Two, one. Wow. That's perfect because on the second shot, I didn't see any glass coming out from the window. That means the uh, rifle round clearly passed through the hole. So that's exactly how it's meant to occur. The sniper bullet travels at just under a thousand metres a second with devastating impact. What is extraordinary for me is the precision. There's one hole and two gunshots. Yeah, that's the exact idea. It's, uh, we've got the shotgun round, the 12 gauge round, making a large hole. And through that hole, we're threading the rifle round, which is a much smaller projectile, but traveling a lot faster. Um, and this is the one that we want to do the business for us. So. The second shot is very close behind the first one. Yes, you, don't, you want them to be close together because you don't want the first one alerting the gunman inside the premises, or, or Monus in this case. So we want them to be following close to behind one another. That's right, yeah. Firing two. OK, so that's a good result. That's, that's a great result. It is, as Mark believes, it could have been on the night of the siege by breaching the glass directly in front of him at the Westpac Bank. That's a perfect shot to clear out a passage for the bullet. Uh, the, the crazing effect that you can see, like the starburst effect, is expected. You may think it would cause a problem in terms of viewing through the sniper scope, but uh, because you're focused so far away, you're not focused at this point, you're focused way through the glass, it shouldn't come up too much when you look in the magnified uh, scope. And looking through the sniper's scope, it is indeed no, a clear view to the target. Mm. So you can't see the glass in front of you no, right now at all? not, not at all. This is the uh, true test, I guess, to see exactly where you hit. But it's at the other end, at what would have been the Lint Cafe, that really counts. Yeah, yeah well, we can see that uh, the round has passed cleanly through the window with, with yeah, too many troubles and hit the target. The shot through the cafe glass is direct and lethal to the target. You can see the entry point there? Yep. And that's the effects of uh, what's called hydrostatic shock, which is basically the energy hitting mm. the soft tissue and spreading. I mean, it's clear that uh, the impact would have been devastating. Oh, undoubtedly, uh, if this was Man Monis, uh, he would be dead for sure. Does that reinforce your confidence? It's always nice to carry out the, uh, the testing and the experiment in this, in this manner in terms of reinforcing, but we were confident. We, we know what we're capable of and we try to shoot within those capabilities. Yeah. Uh, that's the whole point of practicing and learning a craft. Yeah. But in the end, knowing what he could have done but didn't gives Mark little joy. You knew you could have taken him out if only you had the right information. Of course. There was an achievable option to shoot and kill him and save the hostages at that time. It's upsetting, because that's what we're there for. Coming up... I started having uh, flashbacks. The agony of failure. Sorry I couldn't save him. Soothed by remembering... That's Tori. 
There's a, that's Tori. A lost friend's incredible courage. Tori's still behind because he always puts everyone first. That's next on 60 Minutes. It's been a long and rough journey for Mark Davidson since the Lindt Cafe siege. The devastation of watching the execution of hostage Tory Johnson and being powerless to do anything about it has haunted him for years. Initially there was an immense amount of guilt that I had. Even though you knew what you were having to deal with, you carried guilt? Yeah, guilt's not always completely rational, um, and, and it's uh, magnified with the benefit of hindsight. I started having um, flashbacks of Tory dying over and over, to the point where it just became absolutely exhausting. This would occur at any time? All day. Did you know why this was happening? I mean, uh, we, we do uh, awareness training in psychological symptoms and PTSD. So I assumed that that was, that was what was starting to take effect. But you don't really want to admit it. You want to, you want to think that you're stronger than that. Mark's post-traumatic stress disorder was both overwhelming and debilitating. And that's exactly how it's also been for hostage Paolo Vasalo. It's, uh, it's a struggle. You have better days than mothers, but that's the way it is. It's terrible, though, to think that you feel traumatised and that somebody who was trying to help you feels traumatised. It's a terrible outcome, isn't it? It is, it is, but that's, that's the reality. When you're there, in the heart of it, and people die, that's the reality. Mm. And um, you can't, yeah, you can't change that feeling, really. Both Paolo and Mark share the same nightmare, but from different perspectives. Mark as the sniper who felt powerless to act, and Paolo the hostage and Tory Johnson's friend who had prayed that he would. Paolo? Hey, Mark. It is a tough and emotional meeting. I'm sorry I couldn't save him, man. No. I wished I could have. We were desperately, um, desperately searching the windows when Tori was killed, just for a glimpse to see Monas, another opportunity. And this is hard for Paolo to hear because he was so close to Tori, but you Yeah, of course it is. Mm. It, it kills me to know, yeah. His behaviour was, it was quite remarkable because he didn't make any attempt to turn around or look for an opportunity to grab the gun from Monas or, or escape himself. He just sat there like a statue and uh, that's remarkably brave. I, I, that's Tori. There's, there's people that, uh, it's funny, there's a lot of people that come up to me and say, oh, Tory died because he felt like he had to stay behind because he was the manager. No, no, Tory stood behind because that was Tory. He always put everyone first. And I believe, I believe after yeah. watching what I watched, That's I believe that with my yeah. whole heart. Coming up... If, God forbid, it happened tomorrow... Learning valuable lessons. And it would be brought to a swift conclusion. And how to heal... You've had to leave your job, though. I'm not fit to do that work anymore. A wounded sniper. Is there anything you wished you could have changed or done differently? That's next on 60 Minutes. I'm gonna rather... It's taken years for Mark Davidson to feel I'm free. Gonna for so long, the New South Wales Police Chief Sniper carried a terrible burden when hostages Tory Johnson and Katrina Dawson 
died in the Lindt Cafe siege. But today, that guilt is finally lifting. It's real, that guilt. It was there and it was heavy. But I'm past that now. You've processed the day, you've processed your behaviour on the day and the opportunities. Is there residual disappointment about what happened? Or what didn't happen? Yes, there is. Definitely. And that means you feel that it could have turned out differently? <sighs> Essentially, that's the bottom line. Mark is now rebuilding his life. You get snapper here? Big one. Spending time with his dad, who understands more than most what his son has been through. You got a bite? Hey. You're on the surface feeding this time of day. Both have been police officers and both were snipers. It was a dreadful day for everyone, but I guess we didn't expect one of the victims would be your son. No. I could tell when I first spoke to him that night that he was carrying some baggage from it. What do you say to your son? I keep telling him he did everything he could. And I think he did. You've had to leave your job though. Yeah, I was medically discharged. I'm not fit to do that work anymore. How difficult is that? It's hard. It was my career. I didn't want to leave. I don't know how to do anything else. But I'll learn something. It's just the end of a chapter, not, not the end. So I don't know what the new chapter's going to be at this point. Mm. Maybe I'll be a yoga teacher. Come in. Hey. Mark Davidson did his best, but it's taken years for him to accept that. Today, all he's hoping is that, should it happen again, others will be able to do better. We're in a different time now. If, God forbid, it happened tomorrow, I think it would be dealt with very differently and it would be brought to a swift conclusion. And if that meant a sniper taking a shot? Yes. Is there anything you wished you could have changed or done differently? That's a good question. Yeah, there is things that I would have liked to have done differently, but it's the past, I can't change it. I can just hope that uh, we, the collective, have learned important lessons from it and we minimise the chance of it happening again. The New South Wales Police has admitted it got it wrong on the night of the siege and officers should have resolved the situation sooner. Commissioner Mick Fuller says in the event of future terrorist attacks, police will intervene earlier. Legislation in New South Wales has also been passed, giving police the ability to use greater force during terrorist incidents. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.